In this lesson, we will examine a firm's costs in more detail. A detailed study of a firm's costs will help us to better analyze a firm's choices about how much output to produce. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to derive a firm's average and marginal costs and explain the relationship between short-run and long-run costs. After studying this material, you should also be able to identify applications and examples of a firm's costs in articles from the popular press. In our previous lesson, we found the firm's cost function, which describes the minimum amount it will cost a firm to produce output level Y at input prices W1 and W2. Let's start by considering the example cost function that we found in the previous lesson. In that lesson, we found that if a firm has the production function y equals 3 times the square root of x1 times x2, then the cost minimizing amount of input 1 that it should use would be y over 3 times the square root of w2 over w1. And the cost minimizing amount of input 2 that it should use is y over 3 times the square root of w1 over w2. These equations are the firm's conditional factor demand functions, which describe the cost minimizing amount of an input the firm should use to produce a given level of output. If we substitute these equations back into the cost equation, we get the cost function. In the case of this firm, the cost function is 2y over 3 times the square root of w1 times w2. Let's consider this cost function for a moment. What happens to the firm's cost of production as output increases? From the function, we can see that as output increases, costs increase. Hopefully, this result matches your economic intuition. We can also ask what happens to the firm's production cost as the prices of its inputs increase. When this happens, costs increase as well which should also match your intuition. For the remainder of this lesson, we will focus on the relationship between costs and output. Thus, we will treat input costs as fixed. If the costs of inputs are fixed, then the cost function becomes 2 thirds times a constant, which we will call C, times output. If we graph the relationship between costs and output, what will the relationship look like? For this cost function, the graph will look like a straight line extending from the origin. There are a couple of other questions we could ask about this cost function. First, what do the firm's per unit or average costs look like? To find the firm's average costs, divide the cost function by output. When we do this, we find that average costs are constant and equal to 2c over 3. Since this firm's average costs are constant, we know that this firm has constant returns to scale in production. The last question we could ask about this cost function is, is this a short run or a long run cost function? The answer is that it is a long run function. You may be wondering why. The reason why is that there are no fixed costs. You have learned previously that in the long run, all inputs are variable. Thus, a firm will not have any fixed costs in the long run. One of the best ways to distinguish the short run from the long run for a firm is to ask yourself how much it costs the firm to produce zero output. If a firm is producing zero output at a positive cost, then it is operating in the short run. If it costs a firm nothing to produce zero output, then by definition, it is operating in the long run. If there is an input that is fixed, then the cost function is a short run cost function. Let's consider the example cost function from the earlier slides. If we fix the amount of input 2 that the firm is using, its short run cost function is output over 3, times the square root of the product of the input's costs plus the cost of input 2 times the amount of input 2, which is fixed. We indicate that the amount of input 2 is fixed by placing a bar over the variable that represents input 2. Since this last term is just a constant, 
we will call it K. Since input prices are constant, we can simplify this cost function further so that it simply equals a constant A times Y divided by 3 plus another constant K. We can split this cost function into its component parts. First, we could ask which part of this function captures the firm's fixed costs. Since fixed costs do not vary with the level of output, the constant K is the firm's fixed costs. The remaining portion of the cost function, which varies with output, is the firm's variable costs. We could also calculate the firm's average costs. In the short run, the firm has three types of average costs, average total costs, average fixed costs, and average variable costs. To find average total costs, divide the total cost by output. In the case of this cost function, we find that the average total costs are equal to A over 3 plus K divided by Y. To find the average fixed costs, divide the fixed costs by output. For this cost function, the average fixed costs are K divided by Y. To find the average variable costs, divide the total variable cost by output. For this cost function, the average variable costs are constant and equal to A over 3. Note from this example that we can see that average total costs equal the sum of the average variable costs and the average fixed costs. The last type of cost that we care about when analyzing a firm's decisions are its marginal costs. A firm's marginal costs measure the additional cost to a firm of producing an additional unit of output. As with any term with the word marginal in its name, we calculate marginal costs by taking the derivative of the firm's cost function with respect to output. In the case of the example we have been studying, the firm's marginal costs will be the derivative of the firm's total costs with respect to output, which will simply be A divided by 3. Thus, we can see that this firm has constant marginal costs. Note, however, that this will not always be the case. Let's briefly summarize these types of costs. A firm's total costs measure the total cost of producing a given level of output. Remember that this function measures the minimum cost of producing this output level, as we derived it by solving the firm's cost minimization problem. The firm's total cost has two components, total variable cost and total fixed costs. Total variable costs change as the level of output changes. We will represent total variable costs generically with the cost function C of Y. Total fixed costs do not change as output changes. We will represent them generically with the letter F. Average total costs measure the per unit cost of producing a given level of output. To calculate them, divide total cost by output level. Average total cost also has two components, average variable cost and average fixed cost. Average variable costs measure the per unit variable cost of production and equal total variable costs divided by output. Average fixed costs measure the per unit fixed cost of production and equal total fixed costs divided by output. Finally, there are marginal costs, which equal the additional cost of producing an additional unit of output. To calculate a firm's marginal costs, take the first derivative of the total cost function with respect to output. Now that we have described a firm's costs, we can analyze their characteristic shapes. First, let's start with the easiest one, which is average fixed costs. Since average fixed costs are simply a constant divided by output, the average fixed cost function will be shaped like the inverse function. Next, let's consider average variable costs. In our example, average variable costs were constant. However, for most firms, at some point, average variable costs will start to rise. The reason why is that as we add more and more variable inputs to the fixed input, at some point we are going to start hitting the limits of our fixed input. This will cause our variable costs to rise. Lastly, let's consider average total costs. Remember that average total cost equals average variable cost plus average fixed cost. So, the easiest way to see the shape of the average total cost function is to superimpose our two previous cost curves into this graph 
and add them together. When we do this, we see that at low levels of output, average total costs will be high because average fixed costs are high. At intermediate levels of output, average total costs will be lower, and at high levels of output, average total costs will be high because average variable costs are high. Thus, the average total cost curve will have a U-shape. The last type of cost that we need to graph are marginal costs. Before we do this, let's take a quick diversion to consider a general relationship between marginal variables and average variables. For this example, we'll use your grades. For starters, suppose that your current grade in this class is an 85. Then, suppose that you get a 90 on the next exam. Consider this 90 your marginal score. What will happen to your overall average in the class if we add in this marginal score to your average? Of course, you know that your average will increase. Now, let's consider the other case where your marginal score is less than the average, say, a 75. Sadly, we know that if we add a marginal score of 75 into your average, your overall average will fall. This little thought experiment allows us to characterize a general relationship between the marginal and the average. If the marginal is above the average, the average will increase. If the marginal is below the average, the average will decrease. Now we, that we have established a general relationship between marginals and averages, we can start to think about the general relationship between marginal costs and average total costs. We know that in general, the average total cost curve will be U-shaped. If average total costs are declining, then it must be the case that marginal costs are below average total costs, since we know that averages decline when the marginal is less than the average. When average total costs are increasing, the marginal costs must be above the average, since we know that averages increase when the marginal is greater than the average. At the bottom of the U, where the average is not changing, the marginal must just equal the average. By applying this logic, we can now determine the location of the marginal cost curve. When the average total cost curve is declining, the marginal cost must be below it. When the average cost curve is increasing, the marginal cost curve will be above it. Lastly, the marginal cost curve must cross the average cost curve at its minimum value, since at that point, average costs do not change. Thus, the marginal cost curve will generally have a U-shape it will be below the average total cost curve when average total costs are declining, above average total costs when average costs are increasing, and will intersect the average total cost curve at its minimum point. We can now put all of the cost curves into a single diagram. First, we know that average fixed costs will be continually declining. Next, Average variable costs might initially decline or be constant, but eventually they will rise, so they will be U-shaped. Average total costs will be U-shaped as well and will be located above average variable costs. Finally, marginal costs will be below both average variable and average total costs while they are falling, will intersect these cost curves at their minimum values, and will be above these cost curves when they are rising. All of these marginal and average cost functions that we have been examining are short-run functions. What is the relationship between these costs and a firm's long-run costs? Consider the following claim. A firm's long-run costs will be at least as small as its short-run costs. Why will this be the case? Intuitively, in the long run, the firm can do one of two things. It can keep using the same input combination that it uses in the short run when some inputs are fixed, or it can adjust the amount of its previously fixed inputs to produce the same level of output at a lower cost. If the firm chooses the first option, then its long run and short run costs will be the same, 
If it chooses the second option, its long-run costs will be less than its short-run costs. Therefore, we can see that a firm's long-run costs are always at least as small as its short-run costs, and possibly smaller. We can illustrate the relationship between short-run and long-run average costs graphically. Consider a firm who has several potential short-run average cost functions, each one corresponding to a particular factory size that it could build. In the short run, the firm cannot change its factory size, but in the long run, it can choose the factory size that minimizes long-run costs. In the long run, the firm's cost would be the lower bound of these short-run costs. We say that a firm's long-run costs are the lower envelope of its short-run costs. This concludes this lesson on cost curves. You will have a chance to practice deriving cost curves for different types of firms in class.